Hey guys, welcome back to TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Again, it's TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. I'm locked up in one of my dungeons, one of my basements, doing this video for you. It's been a while since I've done a podcast, a long-form podcast. Um, my current studio is currently going through some renovations, so it's out of commission for now. So I'm just kind of doing these things health to skelter kind of everywhere. Uh, you'll see me in the parking lots of some clinics I go to, uh, various offices where the coordinators kind of stuff me in for the time being. But the important thing is I'm here. I'm answering your questions. Tweet me, Cyber Destiny, LinkedIn. I'm going to set up a LinkedIn group very shortly for clinical trial professionals. Uh, I've been getting lots of demand uh, and feedback regarding that. Call me, 949-415-6256. I'm always getting text calls, sending you questions, however you want. Email is also good, dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. I will keep you anonymous unless you specifically ask not to, okay? So let's get right into it. First question I got was in regards to safety letters. So this person had a question in regards to how research clinics receive safety letters and then how CROs make sure that they're that the sites are staying on top of reading them and not just having the PI signing them. So this is a very interesting question. The, the requirements and the regulations are that when an IRB gets a safety um, an adverse event or a serious adverse event, okay from a site for a study anywhere. They will send this out to the sponsor and the sponsor will send it out to all their sites. The idea is that the investigators uh, are aware of what's going on because these are experimental drugs, right? A CRA, and I mentioned this on my last podcast, a CRA told me to treat these investigational products as if they are poison because you do not know what they are, okay? Uh, they're trying to get approval to be used as medication, but for the time being, the safest way to look at it, if you're a research site, is to treat the IP like poison. And obviously, you don't want to promote this to the study participants and uh, market it as such because that's not accurate either. But it's more so from being hyper vigilant from the site. So if you look at the IP as poison, you're going to pay attention to these safety letters because these safety letters are SAEs that are sent from sites as their study participants are experiencing SAEs to the IRB and the IRB will send it off to all the sites. So just because you get a safety letter does not mean that the adverse event was necessarily related to the investigational product. In fact, there's a box on the form which will check off whether it, the investigator thinks it is related to the investigational product or whether the investigator believes that it is not related. And that is up to the sponsor and ultimately the FDA to determine which adverse events are being caused by the IP and which are just adverse events that are happening um, throughout the course of the study, completely unrelated to the investigational product. So. The question is, when a site gets a safety letter, how does the CRO make sure that the site actually reads it? Okay, And the process, at least from my clinics, from my experiences, and I've been doing this since 2004, full-time, part-time since 1999, uh, is the PI is supposed to sign and date each safety letter and then file them in the regulatory binder. Well, that's fine, but how do we know that the PI actually read the safety letter? And the answer in short is we don't. Now, what the CROs can do to make sure that the PIs are alert, are aware, are going to be hyper vigilant about checking out and being on the lookout for these adverse events is when the CROs start noticing something, and this is going to become increasingly more common uh, with risk-based monitoring and that whole analyzing of data in real time 
and making adjustments to the protocol in real time. Uh, the CROs are going to know pretty soon once the study starts, once they get a good amount of data for particular SAEs, serious adverse events, they're going to have a good idea of what is a particular SAE or an adverse event of particular importance. Okay, so I've had studies, I'm not going to mention the sponsor, obviously, but they were looking for rashes. So uh, they alerted all the sites to really pay attention to all adverse events, of course, okay, but especially pay attention to rashes. Or if your patient starts complaining of an itch, you want to catch it early on because the IP is known from previous studies to cause rashes. So the same kind of methodology follows when it comes to other SAEs. So if they're starting to see that um, red blood cells are going down, I'm just throwing things out, I'm not a clinician. Red blood cell count goes down over time with the IP. If you have a study participant who's starting to feel dizzy or is fainting, um, check the labs and look at that because that could be a, protect, uh, a particular adverse event of interest. So other than just kind of emphasizing the SAEs and the adverse events of importance that the site needs to be particularly looking out for, uh, there's really no way for the CRO to ensure that the investigator is reading the safety letter. However, it's in the best interest of the PI and the study coordinator for that matter to be aware of the safety letters that they're receiving. And these safety letters, the amount of safety letters a site gets for a particular study wildly varies. Okay, I have one study uh, that I was actually the coordinator on uh, where we would never get a safety letter. I think in the one year that I've had the study where we were enrolling, I received one safety letter, maybe two. Uh, I have another study where every week we're receiving five or six. So it really depends on the IP. It really depends on what other sites are reporting. It also depends on the length of the study. So if you have an eight week study or less, which is the type of study I had where I wasn't receiving many safety letters at all, you're not that likely to get that many adverse events, much less serious adverse events. However, in like a year or two year long study, you're much more likely to get safety letters because it's just a longer period of time. So it's in the study coordinator and the PI's best interest to read these things and not just sign them. Uh, obviously, you want to know what to look out for. You don't want to rely on the CRO to tell you, hey, look out for this particular AE. They will do that anyways because that's their job. The sponsor wants them to do that. Sponsor hires CROs to make sure that the sites are following GCP and being hyper vigilant about these things. But ultimately, it is the PI's responsibility. Excellent question. I've never actually received that before. So that's a really good question. Next one is regarding CROs and SMOs and what's the difference. So a CRO is a contract research organization. I talk about it often on the blog podcast. Uh, I'm actually in the process of building a CRO. What a CRO does is they monitor sites. So let's say a big sponsor like Pfizer wants to do a study for asthma. So they'll they'll either monitor the sites themselves, select the sites, make sure the sites are following GCP, sending the CRAs out or monitors out on a regular basis, uh, or they'll contract all this out to a CRO and they'll also have the CRO help them with medical monitoring, which is very important and probably the biggest indicator for what the difference is between a CRO and an SMO is does this company have a medical monitor where all the sites when they have a medical issue or a clinical question are required to call this individual or this group of individuals to help them. These are called medical monitors. Every study has one. That's probably the number one indicator of how to quickly, quickly differentiate between a CRO and an SMO. What an SMO is, is a collection of sites. So they may have a site in Atlanta, one in LA, one in Seattle, 
uh, one in Florida, and they'll get one study from a sponsor. They'll negotiate one contract and budget that each site will use, and then they will monitor, they will manage the conduct of the trials at their sites. A big SMO is Radiant Research. I think they became a CRO. Uh, and that's the, that's another thing that causes a lot of confusion is when, when these SMOs get big enough, they want to become CROs. So that's where a lot of the confusion comes in too. So an SMO will not necessarily have a medical monitor. They may have their own internal QA people, which serve as internal monitors that go out to their sites and monitor their sites to make sure that they're following good clinical practice. They may have their own medical monitors just in charge of their sites, but their people, their CRAs, their medical monitors will not look at the other sites outside of their network. So that's the biggest differentiator between a CRO and an SMO. In my opinion, hopefully that helps because I know when I first started research, I was extremely confused about the terminology of CRO and SMO. And when I had like five sites, going on for myself people would ask me are you an SMO and I would say you know honestly I have no idea if I'm an SMO or not I think I was an SMO but uh, that's the best way to figure out the difference between a CRO and an SMO great question hopefully that helps next question is about coordinator burnout so we're not seeing that much of this now because this is September 2014 for those of you watching in the future. Hello. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of coordinator burnout now because the supply study supply is pretty low right now, relatively low compared to other times uh, that we've been accustomed to. But just a few years ago when the study supply was high, uh, sites were giving their coordinators more studies than they can handle. And this especially happens when sites want to increase their profitability and so they think that if they hire more people it's going to decrease their profitability which is true but it's also going to increase the amount of errors you you make or your coordinator makes uh, the amount of queries you're going to get you may actually not be allowed to screen anymore you may be put on an enrollment hold which is what sponsors and CROs do from time to time when a site is having issues, you're going to see potentially see a lot more of that during the risk based monitoring, but we'll get into that later. So how do you avoid study study coordinator burnout? It's a lot easier said than done. Profitability is extremely important. Put aside all this stuff. I'm a businessman first and profitability is king, but as a research clinic, as a research company, you've got to think long term. You can't, and I know it's very easy to think short term. I'm guilty of this. It's a battle I have to fight every day. Short term versus long term. I'm in this for the long haul. Okay, I'm willing to make the invest necessary investments, reduce my profitability now, in order to build bigger, better companies in the future. Um, and a lot of sites are just not willing to do that. A lot of sites, and I can't necessarily blame them. This is the real world we're talking about where profitability is king. And some sites are really struggling and not able to even pay their bills or meet their payroll on time. I've been there, I know. So I'm the last person to tell you to not pay attention to profitability. But when you're starting to see a lot of queries from your coordinator, and start looking at the amount of work your coordinator is actually doing. Okay, if it's a coordinator who's not properly trained, that's one thing. But if they're burnt out because they have too many studies going on, you may need to bring in some help. And it doesn't hurt to talk to the study coordinator and find out from them where can we help you? We're starting to notice some issues. Let's get vigilant about this, proactive, solve this now before the issues become bigger and a lot of sites don't do that because it's difficult and because they're just worried on, about the profits and the business and not the quality but the sites that are focused willing to focus and make the necessary investments for the long term are going to do better 
and you really want to create a culture. I think I read in Fast Company the other day that the most successful companies, what they're really good at, at the end of the day, is building their culture. That means finding, training, and retaining excellent employees to work in your company for the long term. So you want them to be happy as well. Um, and give up a little bit of the profitability at the beginning in order to create and build that culture. And then it's like a snowball. It just snowballs into a big, successful company. Hopefully no burnout for the coordinators. Again, this is all much easier said than done. I'm very much a realist. I do not live in a utopia where I think that, hey, Let's just hire as many coordinators as possible, give everyone all the resources they want. Everyone's going to be happy. I understand it's the real world business is cutthroat, but I really think that just sacrificing a little bit of upfront profitability for the long term growth is a smart move if you're willing to be in this business and you want to be in this industry for a long time. And by a long time, I mean 10 years. Good question. Last one is actually very interesting. It's PI availability versus sponsors increasing demands. So uh, I got a question that pretty much asks, well, it starts off with a complaint from the site about their sponsor. They're saying something along the lines of, we've been doing research for 10 years or more, and we've noticed lately that sponsors are having increasing demands, like they're demanding to speak with the PI um, on a certain day, and if the PI doesn't call on that day, um, they throw a fit, okay? And the PIs are complaining that the sponsor's demands are uh, unreasonable, and they don't always have time. In addition to research, they're out making their hospital rounds, they're doing their private practice. They're going to investigator meetings. They're doing other studies. They don't always have time to be on call for the sponsors when the sponsors demand it. And this is a direct, uh, this is directly correlated with the low study supply that we're in right now in September 2014. This will change. Uh, during the clinical research heyday back in 05, 06, when there was just tons of studies, um, sponsors and CROs were almost begging sites to take on studies, which is the complete opposite of what's going on now. You didn't have these increased sponsor demands. Um, and so the sponsors, if they got to see the PI at one site visit out of three, they were happy. Well, now that's not the case. Now they want to see the PI at every monitoring visit. They want the PIs to be able to have teleconferences with the sponsors at six in the morning uh, on uh, 12 hours notice. Uh, and oftentimes PIs are used to the good old days and they're not, they're not able to change their mentality and understand that we're in a new era of research and when you combine that and compound that with the fact that we're in a low supply of studies right now, at least this period, which I think is going to be changing right around early 2015. But for the time being, for the next six months, it's going to be this way. Sponsors are going to have increased demands. And again, going back to my last topic, if you're in this for the long haul, you got to understand that things don't always stay the same. So when things were easy and P sponsors didn't care when the PI would call them, they would just be happy that the PI is doing the study. Um, that didn't stay the same for long. Right now where we have low study supply and sponsors are demanding PIs to call them at six in the morning or go uh, to an investigator meeting within 72 hours notice, uh, that's not gonna stay for long. But PIs can't be rigid and I know it's extremely difficult. I deal with tons of PIs on a daily basis. Uh, they're oftentimes stuck in their mentality that, hey, I'm the doctor. I'm not going to uh, 
uh, go down to the sponsor's demands uh, whenever they call me. Um, hey, you've got to be willing to be flexible, especially if you have any ambition to make your clinic and your research organization successful. Okay, very much related to my last topic, invest for the long haul. And just know that when things get tough, they don't always stay the same. The one thing that is guaranteed is that things will change. And that's true for when study supply is low, study supply is high, sponsors are having increasing demands, uh, sponsors, they don't care what the PI does. Nothing's constant. Everything changes. Everything goes through fluxes. And uh, I think it's just important to keep that in mind, right? I wanted to give all my clinical trial guru producers a mention here. It's South Coast Clinical Trials, Sarah Elizabeth Siegler, Resolve Research Solutions, Accurate Clinical Trials, Erdhart Clinical Trials, PTNR, Patrick Stone, Darshan Kulkarni, Biofarm Systems, Zymewire, Mozio, St. Paul Medical Research Center, Investigator Research Group, Phlebotomy Services, Atria Clinical Research Management, Rheumatic Disease Clinical Research Center, Clinexus Research LLC, Coastal Connecticut Research LLC. Thank you all very much. Uh, this is Dan from theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Cyberdust me. I'm Dan Sfera. Tweet me, LinkedIn, Facebook, email, Pinterest if you want, Instagram. I'm everywhere. I connect with people everywhere. Uh, let me know if you want the LinkedIn group, if you want to be a member. It's by, it's by uh, approval only, so I manually am going to approve every LinkedIn member. It's completely free. I don't even think LinkedIn lets you charge for that, but I wouldn't. Uh, but I want to make sure that the appropriate people are going to be there so that People are comfortable within the group to share and discuss real things without worrying about who's reading it. Uh, but Cyberdust is a great tool for that. And so is Snapchat, and I know that's a younger demo, but a lot of these future researchers and future doctors who I'm already networking with on Twitter, people in med school who want to be PIs, they're on Snapchat. Guess what? I'm Snapchatting with them. I'm getting at that ghost that Snapchat icon, and messaging these people. However people want to communicate, that's where you should be. That's where I'm at. If I'm not on a platform, let me know if you'd like one, and I'll get on it, all right? This is Dan from theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Thank you for watching, listening, and take care.